Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Welcome. So glad that you're here today. If you are in Center Court East, if you're in Center Court West, if you're in the woodlands, if you're online, however it is that you're um, here today, we're just really glad that you're here. So take your Bibles and we're going to go to Luke chapter 5 in just a minute. And if you need a Bible, why don't you flag down one of the ushers, just wave your hand. They'd be glad to let you have one of our Bibles. And we'll go to Luke, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke in the New Testament chapter 5. So in my parents' home for years and years was a wall in the closet of their bedroom. And on that wall were ascending little hash marks of pencil lead. Those hash marks represented all of the growth points that my sister and I had made over the years because every year on our birthday, each of us had to stand up against that wall and they'd put a book right there on our head and they'd mark off, here's how you've grown. It always made for an interesting uh, you know, look back to see what years we'd sort of moved along and all. And it's, it's interesting to look back, not just at how we've grown in height, right, but in all sorts of things. That's why we keep scrapbooks and photos and sort of look back and see, wow, look how I've progressed, look how, how we've come along, look at the changes that have happened um, over the years, right? And so <clears throat> I mention that because in the very same way, we should be able to see some progress that's happening in our spiritual lives, shouldn't we? My concern, though, is that there's any number of people, perhaps hundreds, thousands, maybe right here in this church, maybe in every single church in the whole wide world of people who come to church with some regularity, with some frequency. Maybe they come seasonally, maybe they come monthly, maybe they come you know, every other week, maybe some even come weekly. But if you were to ask them, okay, for all the years that you've gone to church, you've gone 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you've seen hundreds of services, you've heard hundreds of sermons, has it changed you? I'm afraid that all too many people, if they were honest, would say, eh, not really. I'm pretty much steady Eddie the whole way through. But that's a problem, right? Because if you looked at the hash marks on a wall, a height chart, and there was no progression, that would tell you something had gone dreadfully wrong, right? Or if you looked in a scrapbook and you noticed that you never got any older and you never lost any hair from year to year to year, <laughs> that actually, that wouldn't be such a bad thing. But it wouldn't be real, right? Because in reality, we're always moving forward. We're supposed to be making progress, why is this? Because living organisms grow. Healthy organisms grow. Stagnation is bad. And that's why we need to talk about it in the spiritual realm as well. And to do so today in the next several weeks, I want us to look at this guy in the New Testament whose name was Peter. Peter was a fascinating character. Is altogether different than a very another famous Christian in the New Testament whose name was Paul. Now, the, the interesting thing about Paul, his story was, was so, uh, you know, transformation. It, it was, it was you, you had this, this guy that was going along and he was just bad, 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 killing Christians, killing Christians. Wham! He meets Jesus on the uh, road to Damascus and then... Several days later, he's preaching the gospel and writing letters to the church. And you never really get to see the development. Now, we know that he did take some steps and he made some progress along the way in his faith. And we know generally kind of where that happened and when that happened. But the narrative of scripture doesn't tell us much about it. And, and the truth of the matter is I've never met a Christian like Paul who was just bad good and just serving Jesus the rest of his life. I've never met that kind of person. But Peter... Now, he's a guy I can really relate to, and I think you'll be able to as well. Because Peter, you know, he was this ordinary man. He was very ordinary. He was smart enough, but not brilliant, not really profound. He had really good intentions, but he made some pretty big mistakes. He was impulsive. He was uninhibited. He would blurt out, you know, and, and act out without careful thought. Probably in today's terms, he would be diagnosed as having ADHD. 
Seriously. Probably a little Ritalin or a little intuitive would have just slowed him down enough that he could have focused right in and maybe cut some of the losses before they happened, okay? So, so Peter was always thinking big. He thought big, and he wanted to do great things for the Lord and for his kingdom. But often he was unsuccessful as bringing those things through to completion. Sometimes he was brave. Sometimes he was a coward, like a lot of people I know. I want us to look at the first scene uh, here that we're going to look at these four weeks that gives us insight to how his spiritual journey began. Okay, Luke chapter 5, and <clears throat> we'll start in verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, it's also called the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Now, let's get the scene here in our minds. So you have this sort of picture, this sloping hillside. If you've ever been to the Sea of Galilee, you kind of can picture this is sloping hillside and Jesus is on the downside of the slope kind of down by the water and the people are sort of sort of amphitheater style and and so he's 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 teaching them but they keep encroaching upon him which they always did the crowds always move towards Jesus you know and and so he's going back and back and back and finally his feet are nearly in the water and and so at this point he looks over and he sees a couple of boats and one of them's Peter boat and and so he just sort of leaps over into Peter's boat and says, hey, just push out just a tad and get a little space now that's comfortable. And he could use sort of the natural amphitheater uh, acoustics uh, as his words hit the water and then went up uh, to the hillside. He continued uh, teaching along. Now, what were Peter and Andrew and James and John doing? Well, it says that they had been out fishing the whole night before and they were cleaning their nets, which is what you did if you were a fisherman the next day because you had to take care of your stuff and you knew that you were going to always scoop in a lot more things than just fish. You're going to rake in some beer cans and cigarettes and sunglasses and anything else that was floating in the Sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago. So that's, that's what was going on uh, as Jesus hops into the boat and continues on in the teaching. Now, what we don't know is how long he was teaching from Peter's boat. The sermon might have gone another 15 minutes, maybe 20, maybe 30, maybe an hour, maybe more than an hour. But then he finishes his teaching, and he turns to Peter, and he speaks. Now, here's the interesting thing. He could have said so many things to Peter. At that point, he could have looked at Peter and, and said, hey, did you listen to that? How'd you like that? How'd you think I did? He could have said that. He could have said, hey, Peter, I never asked you. How many fish did you catch last night? He didn't ask that. Let's look at what he did say when he turned to Peter. <clears throat> what if I could find it? All right, so, verse, verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, that's Peter's other name, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Put out in the deep water. Let the nets down. Now, there's two problems with this request that are going through Peter's mind. The, the first request is, he's thinking, Jesus, wait a second. I don't know if you were paying attention to what we were doing while we were just paying attention to your teaching, but we've been sitting here cleaning our nets out. That's what you do when you're finished fishing, okay? We just fi That's like saying, hey, let's go horseback riding. to somebody who just came in, put the saddle up, groomed the horse. I just did that. So your timing's a little bit off, Jesus. And then there's another problem with this request. Peter's thinking, uh, Jesus, it's not nighttime, and you only fish hear the way we do it at nighttime. You, you don't go do it in daytime. You don't do daytime fishing. Now, the reason for that was the Sea of Galilee <clears throat> um, was a, a, it's a body of water that you can actually see a, across. So it's, it's more like a, a lake. And the fish would come to the surface at night because the water was cooler. But during the day, they would descend lower 
because the water was cooler down there as the water heated up on the top, right? And they weren't doing deep sea fishing. They had shallow net fishing. That's kind of what they were doing. And, and so Peter's thinking, wait, you're asking us to go daytime fishing? You don't go daytime. I mean, you're a good preacher and teacher, and I, that was really kind of a good lesson, what you just did. And, and I hear you're a good carpenter, but you don't know squat about fishing because you don't go do that in the daytime, Peter. So there's two problems that, that Peter's probably having, definitely having uh, inside when, Peter, when Jesus says, Peter, let's go out in the deep and go fishing right now. Now, Peter, notice this. He's very respectful. He, he says, um, master, which is, it, he wasn't, it wasn't God. It wasn't Lord. It wasn't any divine. You know, it was, it was just master, which is respectful, sort of like um, professor or rabbi or mister doctor he was being respectful he's like uh, master we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything now what was jesus asking peter to do he was asking peter to do something that peter had done a thousand times but he was asking him to do it in a way He'd never done it before. That's the key. What was at stake? Trust. Trust was at stake. Because Peter's thinking to himself, okay, yeah, I trust that you're a pretty good preacher, and I trust you're probably a pretty good carpenter, but yeah, fishing's what I do. I don't know if I can trust that you know anything about fishing. You're telling us that it's the wrong time of day, and it had everything to do with trust, which is what makes the next part of the story so awesome. So, verse 5, <clears throat> what does he say? He says, um, but because you say so, I will, and we'll let down the nets. Okay? He, he's saying, Jesus, um, I'm certainly not going to do this because I think it's going to work out. <laughs> and I'm not doing it because it's going to help my reputation. And Oh, see, that's another thing. He's seen all the, the crowds there, and, and he's thinking to himself, Jesus, you drew quite a crowd. They're going to think I'm crazy if I go out to go daytime fishing. But, so, you know, I'm going to do it, but not because I think it's going to help my reputation, not because I think it's going to work, but because you say so. Let's go daytime fishing. Here we go. All right, so <clears throat> now... Let's stop here and just say something that I think is very true. Actually, what was going on inside of Peter is actually what's going on inside of many of you right now. Not fishing, but the deeper meaning. In many of your lives, right now, at this juncture, you've been feeling the whisper of the Lord saying, this is what I want you to do. You've been feeling this sort of this nudging, this is, this is the way, walk in it. Here, this, and you're like, I don't think that makes any sense. And, I, I, and what if it, it might be embarrassing? It, oh, God, I don't think, how do you know if you're really hearing from God? I don't know if that's real. You know, but it just keeps coming back. You just keep, come on, come on, come on, that little elbow and the nudge. And you're like, oh, Lord, is that you? And then another person will come up and randomly say the same thing. You're like, how do you even know that? I don't know. I just kind of felt like I was supposed to come and tell you that. And, you know, and, and <clears throat> any number of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you're exactly where Peter was he's saying i want you to go i want you to launch out into the deep now let's suppose at this juncture before we read on that jesus had made it really easy for peter because because it was trust it was all about trust it was all about faith right that's what jesus is calling peter to do just trust me this is going to work out okay and that's what he's calling all of us to do i want you to trust me with your life with this decision Trust me, Peter. That's what he was saying. Right. Now, but suppose for the sake of illustration, just to make it really easy, he said, okay, okay. Peter, I can tell you're really scared. You're afraid of being embarrassed. So let me help you. And suppose that Jesus had just dropped this screen right there, if they had screen technology back then. And suppose he had just put this picture right up on the screen and said, see that building right there? Peter, that is St. Peter's Basilica. That is going to be your tomb, 
Okay, trust me, this is gonna work out really well for you. Okay, someday millions of people will know of you, Peter. You're not just an ordinary fisher. I mean, you're, you, people will come from all over the world. It'll take more than a hundred years for them to build that building, Peter. Trust me, this is gonna work out really well if you'll just say yes. Now, if Jesus had done that, I'm sure Peter had been like, well, if that's the case, I'll take you daytime fishing every day this week. I mean, I mean you can have the whole boat. But Jesus didn't do it that way, and he doesn't do it that way for us either, does he? Because there wouldn't have been any faith. There wouldn't have been any trust involved. So he never lets us see what it's going to look like on the back end. He says, now I'm just asking you to take the next step. So <clears throat> Peter chose well and out they go. Verse six, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Okay, now what has happened? Right here in this quick minute, he's gone from addressing him as master, just the title of respect, to Lord. In the Greek, that's kyrios. That's a word for the divine. All of a sudden, he's like, whoa. We just went daytime fishing, caught more fish than I've ever seen in my life in one boat, make that two boats. The only, only God... Oh, you're no ordinary rabbi. And Jesus is like, that's right. He's like, Lord, just, just, that means you know everything about, yeah, I know everything. Go away from me. I'm, I'm a sinful man. Sort of like that passage in Isaiah where he says, my, just, oh, God, my, my lips are unclean. Just, just go away from me, Peter is saying. Now, I want to ask you a question. In this uh, instant, uh, instant uh, story that we've just looked at, what changed about Jesus from before he had gotten in the boat to the uh, miracle of the fish. What had changed? Nothing had changed about Jesus. He was the same person before as he was after the miracle. The change had come in Peter. Now, the fact that Peter could have been so close to Jesus, right there in the same boat with Jesus and not realized who he was, I think that triggers to me and should to all of us the reality that the same thing can happen to any of us. In fact, I'm willing to bet that there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people in this church and in every church around the whole wide world who you're, you're pretty close to Jesus. In proximity, I mean, you're close enough. You hear, you hear his word. You admire his teachings. You even sing some songs about him. You're like, yeah. But you haven't got to the point that Peter got to, where he said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do what you're calling me to do. I'm gonna, we're gonna go do this. It's kind of crazy, but we're, I'm gonna do it because you're telling me to do it. And you certainly haven't gotten to the point of falling at his feet and just saying, okay, I'm, we're not just gonna do it like one time. Well, I'll just, I'm just giving you my whole life, whatever, whenever, however, wherever, I'm all yours. I think there's thousands of people who are that close to Jesus, but you just haven't really stepped into it. Not really, you haven't. Now, <clears throat> uh, let's finish the story. Um, and then I want to say a, a, a few things. Okay, verse 9. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. But notice what Jesus says to Peter. He says, Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And so they pulled their boats up on shore and they left everything and they followed him. In other words, the, what, what Jesus was saying is, is, Peter, you've always focused on catching fish. Now you're going to catch people. You're going to help me catch men and women. You'll catch them, I'll clean them. You'll catch them, you'll bring them to me, and I'm going to transform them. I'm going to let them experience my love and my grace and my power and the purpose that I have for their lives, which, 
by the way, Peter, has everything to do with the purpose that I've just given to you. You're not going to be about fish anymore. You're going to be about people. And at that moment, Peter's priorities were all together different. So as he dropped his nuts and, and off they went. Apparently, he just walked away. They just walked away from the catch of a lifetime. Now, this is a fantastic story because I think it illustrates s- several phases or stages that characterize every person, every single one of you, hearing my voice right now, four in particular. And I want to look at those four. Giving credit where credit is due to Andy Stanley, Stanley for many of the thoughts uh, in, in this message, okay? So if you're taking notes, here's the first stage, okay? We'll, we'll call this stage the sit and listen stage. How'd the story begin? Peter was just sitting there listening. He was cleaning his nets and he's listening to Jesus. You know, that's interesting. He's cleaning his nets and sort of doing. This is an important phase because really when you think about it, nobody ever followed Jesus who didn't first do some sitting and listening. You, you have to have sort of an opportunity to hear the gospel, to consider the claims of the gospel, to ask some questions about it to process it, to try it on. You, 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 you got to have some opportunities. To, so we'll call this the sit and listen stage. I have a feeling there's any number of you that this is exactly where, maybe you came at Easter. Maybe Easter was your first time and you're like, wow, you know, that was really good. In fact, we ought to, do, we ought to go back. Let's go back. And we should learn a little bit, more, especially we're going to have a baby here in a few months and you got to have the baby come along to church or something, don't you? And th- you didn't even try to, but th- by, do it, by being here right now, you were saying, I, I want to sit and listen. I want to think about it. And that, by the way, is why we have environments like we call the, the starting point class, which is about eight or nine weeks, where you can just sit and listen with some other people and ask some questions. And it's not like, call on me. No, 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 don't call on me. I'm here to sit and listen. And I'm going to ask some questions because I'm trying to figure out some stuff about the Christian faith. Okay? So this is where you are. That's awesome. That's fantastic. That's a great place to be. It's not a great place to stay forever, but it's a great place to start. But you got to move on. Sooner or later, you got to move on. The second phase or the second stage we'll call the um, the loan him the boat stage. Okay? So here's Jesus teaching from the shore. Here's Peter, his boat right here. And finally, Jesus backs up and just sort of hops on the boat and probably said, hey, you mind if I just stand there? I need, you know, and I'm sure Peter's like, sure, whatever. And, you know, and so before he knows it, his his boat is now a floating pulpit. And here's the reality. It didn't cost Peter very much to to let Jesus come on his boat and teach from. It didn't cost very much. It wasn't very inconveniencing. He didn't really have to change much about what he was still cleaning his nets. In fact, I have a feeling that Peter probably swelled up after a moment when it sunk in. Jesus is in my boat. He probably swelled up just with a little bit of smugness, a little bit of pride, thinking, I got the most popular rabbi in Palestine teaching from my boat. Yeah, baby. You know, and, and, and I think sometimes when we're at the loan him the boat stage, that we kind of, it, it feels actually pretty good. This is where we come along and say, okay, you know what? I, I think I will give a little bit back to God, you know, and maybe a drop in a hundred or 200 bucks or something. You're like, hey, you know, actually that feels pretty good because you should give. Everybody should give, right? A little bit, something, right? Aren't you supposed, then you get taxed right up. That's right. Okay, but you know, you, you feel kind of good about it. Or, or somebody comes along and says, Okay, I, you know, sure, I'll get in a serve team. I'll get in a grow group. What's an hour or two? Yeah, I can do that. And plus, I'll probably make some friends and you know, be more involved ar- around here. That'd be a good thing, right? Right. Okay, so yeah, I can do that. See, it's, it's, it doesn't cost a lot, and it's not terribly inconveniencing. And it actually feels kind of good. Okay, that's, a, that's the thing about when, when you're at the loan him the boat phase. But you, again, you can't just stay here. you got to move on. And this is the next one is really where things start to get exciting. 
we'll call this stage the take him fishing stage. This is where Jesus said, Peter, now that I'm done with my sermon, thanks for letting me borrow your boat, by the way. Now let's launch out into the deep and let's do some daytime fishing. Now, this is where it gets real exciting because this is where the Lord begins to get beneath the surface in our lives. And he moves beyond the window treatments. And he moves beyond the self-patting on the backs that we do about, yeah, I'm good with God and I'm good with church and, yeah, I'm even on one of those serve teams. And it's, it's all, no, 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 he, he, he moves us beyond that. And, and now it's actually going to start to cost something. This is where we begin to think, oh, what if that doesn't work out? That might be embarrassing. I, are you sure? I don't know, Lord. I bet you it's going to have something to do with one of several categories, a relationship, a job, your finances, or your time. Maybe even coming in here today, you've, you've just had this sort of this nudging in your soul saying, you know, this relationship isn't right. You just keep staying in this relationship, but you know it's not right. And, or maybe, maybe you come in here today and you've kind of had this sense, it's about my job. I mean, you got a good job and it pays and thank the Lord for everybody who has a job, right? And, but there's something going on there and it's not right. Maybe it's un, unethical or something's just not right. And lately you've been thinking, I got to get out of here, but where would I go? And it does pay, and I'm not the unethical one. I mean, I think I've heard it kind of happening over there, but it's not really me. And the Lord's been saying, no, 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 you're really hearing me. You, I have something better for you. Or others of you, yet, yeah, you, you've heard people, especially if you've been around here for any length of time, who say, yeah, I went on this week-long mission trip, and it just rocked my world, and we flew to this country or that place or what. And you're like, uh, you know, that's great for you, but give up a week of my vacation to go serve other people? I don't think so. And, but you've been feeling the Lord saying, no, really, that's the next step for you. Now, here's the interesting thing about it. I don't even have to tell you what it is. Because if this is where you are, you came in here today already knowing. And the only reason the Lord made you come here today, brought you here today, was to hear me say, come on, take the next step. Let's move forward. That's the third stage. Then finally, you do that a few times, and you test God, and, 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 and you trust him, and then you see how good he is and how he came through, and you, and you do it again, and you see. And finally, you come to this point where, where you, just, you just throw yourself at his feet, and you're just like, okay, Lord, I give up. <laughs> you, you are just so in control. I'm yours, whatever, whenever, however, wherever. I'm just my whole life. No more game playing. No more shoulder patting. And did you see how I helped her? And did you see what I gave to her? I'm beyond that. I'm just, I'm all in for you, Lord. Whatever you want me to do with my life, wherever, whenever, how, I'm just, I'm yours, Lord. I belong to you. We'll call this the fall at his feet phase. Now, here's the reality. This is really where he wants all of us. In the same way that he wanted to lead Peter to this point, he wants to lead you there as well. He wants all of your, he doesn't want to be just doing some window treatments on your life. He didn't come to just say, hey, let me help you spiff up your life a little bit or make it a little bit better or give you a good example so you can follow my example. That's not why he came. He came saying, no, 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 you, you, oh, goodness, no. I, I came because you will never have life without me. I mean, you'll be alive and you'll go through the motions, but you won't have real life without me. I came not to give you an example. I came to live the life that you could not live. I came to be your substitute, to, to, to live a perfect life because you'll never live one. And I came to die a death that you deserve to die for your sins. But I did it as your substitute 
so that if by faith you would put your trust in me, you could have my life flowing through you. But it's life for life. I'm going to give you my life, but I'm, I'm going to ask you to hand over the keys of yours. But here's the fascinating thing. Once you go along in life, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you, and you trust him, and he says, take me fishing, take me daytime fishing. Oh, my gosh, it doesn't make any sense. But you do it, and it works, and you say, oh, my gosh, Lord. Finally, you do. You fall at his feet, and you're just like, you really are God. Why did I ever even play those games and, and sort of treat Christi my Christian faith as this extracurricular activity or this resume booster? Forgive me, Lord. It was just all, it was all I just, I, I'm beyond that now. All of me belongs to you. I was thinking as I was just pondering, talking to you yesterday about various junctures in my life. I haven't got them all right, I'm sure. But a few times I have, and I was thinking about the one that's most relevant to you. 17 years ago, I got a phone call from a guy named John. I was living in um, Kentucky, and he was here in Houston. And he called me one night, and he said, Ken, um, we want you to move back to Houston because we need for you, we want for you to start a new church in Northwest Houston. And he said a few other things, and he said, sleep on it tonight and call me in the morning with your answer. And I remember hanging up, and, and on the one hand, I was, I was so exhilarated. I was like, wow, what an opportunity to, to start a, a new church. And, and I was terrified at this. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what do I know about starting a church? I just read some books on it, and it seemed pretty cool, you know. But, but, but you know, and, and, and there I was at that night. I, I was just, just going, swinging back and forth from this thrill, this, this exhilaration to this absolute terror at the thought of it. And, and I remember lying there thinking, oh, think how it could work out. I mean, maybe we would get a dozen people or two dozen people and become a hundred people and maybe someday a thousand people and we would actually start to push back the darkness in our community and lives would be changed and souls would be saved and, and we'd make disciples who made disciples and but it really could be a great thing. But then I'd flip it over and think, yeah, but it could be a disaster. I mean, more than half new church starts don't make it. They're folded up and gone within five years. Gosh, That'd be embarrassing. But I think I'll do it. I think this is the next step. No! You know, it's a, that, was a, that was a tumultuous night. Well, you know how the story comes out because here we are 17 years later. And yeah, well, praise the Lord. So, so I can tell you this in no uncertain terms. For as many more days or years as the Lord gives me here on earth. I'll never look back on that night and regret the decision I made to take the next step. But what about you? I just have this sneaking suspicion that any number of you, some of you who are kind of new to this whole Christianity, Jesus, Bible, church thing, some of you, you, you may be very well experienced. You're like, oh, I knew this story even when you started telling the story. But, but all of a sudden, somewhere along the way, the Lord said, no, but I'm talking to you, well experienced Christian as well. There's a next step for you. So will you take it? That's the question. My hope is that even as we come to the Lord's Supper in just a moment, you will. That you'll actually make walking forward to get the little piece of bread in the basket and dip it into the, to the grape juice. That you'll just actually make that uh, an opportunity, a moment of worship just where you sort of say, yes, Lord. Because I don't know what he's saying in your hearts, but, but you know. And I think that's why he brought you here today so that you might say, yes, Lord, I'll take the next step. So let's just remember what it is that we're celebrating, and that is that the, um, the Jesus that we've been talking about, the night before he went to the cross for our sins, he took the bread and he broke it. 
And he said, this is my body and it's broken for you. And then he took the cup and he said, this represents my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And he was saying, every time you come and you take these symbols, you're going to remember that I had every anticipation and expectation of being very much a part of your life. Not just an old historical thing that happened 2,000 years ago, but your life today. I'm still at it, he would say. So even as you come, I invite you, won't you take that step? Now, a few practical details and then we'll come. First of all, sometimes new people uh, say, I've never been here. I'm not a member here. You know, can, can I, am I welcome to come too? And the answer is yes. It's not the faith bridge table. It's the Lord's table. Okay? The only, the only requisite is, do you love the Lord? Or are you ready to start? And if you can say yes to that, then you come. The ushers are going to lead us in just a moment, and you'll come forward, and as I said, you'll get a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup. And then if you need the gluten-free elements, because we got that in all of our rooms, go to my right, your left, just sort of make your way around the rest of the people, and you go there, and um, that way you can have the gluten-free elements. After you've taken those, you can kneel if you'd like to have some moment in prayer, and we'll have some prayer partners, and I think most of them have the red shirts on, so I think you can kind of see them. If you want somebody to pray with you, just walk towards one of them and say, would you just pray for me about this? And they'll pray for you. And so the ushers will guide you, and, and the musicians will be leading us, and we'll continue to sing and, and, and worship um, together. So let's pray now. Lord, thank you for the way that you took hold of that guy, Peter, just minding his own business one day, cleaning his nets. Little did he know what a thrilling adventure that you had in store for him. And that indeed, we would remember him 2,000 years later, still talking. Lord, the exciting thing for any of us, all of us, is to consider the fact that you have plans for each of our own lives. You got steps that, you, that you're calling each of us to take, that next step. And that stagnation was never your desire. That's not what you call any of us to, just to stagnate. And so, Lord, my prayer is that even in this time of communing with you, as we come to your table, that you would meet with us that you'd speak to each of us in our own hearts, just in that sort of quiet way that you do. Give us that nudging, give us that prompting, and give us the courage and the faith to say, yes, I'll take that next step. So won't you meet with us, Lord, right now, in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ken who just started a four-part series called Next, a look at the life of Simon Peter. And today you talked to, gave us a great intro into um, Peter and how we're going to look at his journey of faith. Many of us can relate to um, a lot of the things that he struggled really with. Well um, and we had several questions come in. We're going to look at um, what do you do if you're in one stage and your spouse is in another. Okay. We're going to also look at um, how do we firm up our beliefs even though we weren't there in the boat that day. Okay. And um, then we're lastly going to look at how do we know that we're hearing from God to take the next step. Right, so I'm just going to jump okay. right in with the first one. Okay. Um, so we've heard a lot about being uh, spiritually yoked with your spouse. Right. Um, and so is this the same as being at different stages? Uh, what do you do if your spouse is at, say, the sit and listen phase and mm -hmm. you're in the take and fishing phase? How do you help your spouse grow in their faith? Sure. Well, you, you go slow. I think um, Peter addressed that. Re See, if you, if you 
jump over, we're talking about Peter, but you jump over to the letters that he wrote years later when he's a strong Christian and, and he's writing to the Christians. And some of the ladies, the, the married Christian ladies were saying, can we divorce our husbands? They're losers. They don't love Jesus. Can we just move on? And so Peter is addressing that very thing. Um, I'm going to say the questioner was asking that severe, but, but I think it's relevant what he says. So uh, wives in the, uh, 1 Peter 3, wives in the same way submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and the reverence of your lives, your beauty shouldn't come from outward adornment, um, hairstyles and jewelry and all that kind of stuff, but inwardly. Mm. And, and, and so what he was saying is, hey, you could play a crucial role. No, don't drop the guy. Model for him what the Lord has done in you. And who knows, but maybe that'll bring him alone, mm -hmm. long. So I've seen examples of that right here at Faith Bridge that are very inspiring. I'm, I was uh, thinking particularly about a situation some, several years ago when the, we were, I think, maybe raising the money to build this building or something. And a, and a wife came up and said, you know, I would really like to be generous and support. I believe in this and love the Lord, blah, blah, blah. But my husband's just not, just not in it. And what should I do? And sh should I just do it anyhow? And I was like, no, I don't think so. I think in this instance, you know, you've got two things going on. You've got uh, a biblical instruction to be generous, tithing, you know, whatever. And you've got this, which I just read. I think you got to defer to this one first. And don't start with this one. Let's start with this one. And in time... We'll just trust that God's going to soften his heart and he'll be ready to, to do that part as well. So maybe that can be relevant to the questioner's circumstance. Right. Thank you. And so for the next question, um, an interesting question, uh, looking at the apostles. Even the 12 apostles that Jesus chose needed miracles to be convinced that he was God and to see him. How can we, who um, have not experienced the same miracles, how can we be certain and, and be shored up in our faith of who he is. Right. Like us, because right. none of us have seen him yet with our own two eyes. We've seen his power and we've seen his, his presence in our life, his, his hand, you know, working. And I think it's a progressive thing. I think, you know, uh, one uh, step of faith uh, is rewarded and you kind of notate, okay, I got to note to self, I, I Let's remember how that felt and how that came about. And not that God ever always works in the same way, but let's let's just see if you know. And the next one comes, and and you see God work, and you just sort of develop this ability to say, "Okay, I'm going to walk where I sense that you're saying walk." You're always looking for scriptural confirmation, for maybe a character in scripture or some verses that speak exactly to the situation, um, and. Christian community can be helpful as well. And so, um, but, you know, I was thinking of Thomas, um, doubting Thomas. Remember, he, he just could not believe that Jesus was alive. Everybody else says he's alive, but Thomas says, I, I can't believe it until I see it. And finally, Jesus appears, and he lets him touch and, and, and see, and then he believes and says, my Lord and my God. This is at the end of John. And then Jesus tell, told him, because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who've not seen and yet have believed. Mm -hmm. Well, so I think we have to just keep in mind, because that's most of us. Mm -hmm. Peter and a few of the others did get to see some pretty big things. Even that, it was new for them, because Jesus was just new to all of them. And... Um, but we step forward in faith, and um, from step to step we go. Great. And so the first step being the step out in faith, but talking through these stages mm -hmm. of your faith journey today, right. um, how do I know when and where to take the next step? Um, this 
person that wrote in this question said that they have a stirring in their heart for a while mm -hmm. that they've been hearing God's calling, mm -hmm. um, but they're just not sure what that next step should be. How, how do you discern that? What, where God's calling to you to for the next step? Right. Well, see number two, uh, <laughs> scripture. I think if we're, if, we're, if we're really feeding on God's word, he's going to speak to us. Um, even this past week in my devotional life, on Thursday in particular, I was at this real crossroads trying to figure out, do I do this or do I do that? And I was just studying um, just the normal plan that, that you, know, you kind of got your plan, whatever your plan is. And so I was just on the verses of my plan. And God just reached out and grabbed me through that. And so you're going to his word. Sometimes if we're trying to discern what's the next step, what do you want me to do, Lord? This is community. Mm -hmm. Christian community is so important, mm -hmm. crucial to this, to have a brother or a sister in Christ or two of them that you can say, you know, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about that. I'm just, I'm looking for wisdom. You know, we're praying hard about it. Do you have any impressions? You know? Or if you're just a blank slate and you're like, I, I want to take a next step. I just don't have any idea what my next step would be. Well, I think, you know, sometimes you just give it time and, and he, he'll make it louder and louder. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it'll get clearer and clearer. Um, so just stay with it. I know I found in my life that it doesn't go away. That's right. Right. No matter... How, what I do and pray about it or sure. line it up with scripture. You can't shake you, it. You can't shake it. If it it's from the Lord. It continues yeah, to be. He's going to, he's, he's, Jonah, he didn't want to go preach to the Ninevites. Uh, and he did his gut level best to not, mm. but it just got louder and louder okay. and he ended up there. Well, great. I yeah. uh, really uh, enjoyed this look today and have some steps to think through. And I know our groups will um, have some great conversation around the steps as well this week. So Good. thank you very much. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.